We are live. And good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. We're going to start here in just a few minutes. I want to give everybody a chance to grab a cup of coffee and get themselves situated. Um, in the house, we have uh, Den Jones, uh, our venerable CSO, who's joined Banyan uh, over the last few months, uh, drawing on more than 20 years of experience driving IT and security initiatives at long, large enterprises like Adobe and Cisco. Uh, Den has brought zero trust implementations to over 150,000 employees. Uh, and Tarun Desikan, our COO and co-founder of Banyan. He's responsible for product strategy and ecosystem partnerships. And today the two of them are gonna uh, talk about our journey to the modern VPN alternative. Just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, if you guys want to chat with us at any time, you can raise your hand. Um, can I see a show of hands? <laughs> Just to make sure that's working. Um, and Den, can you see hands going up? Oh, Den, I see your hand. Okay, everybody can go ahead and uh, put their hands down. Um, and also you can pop in questions at any time in the Q&A area. And uh, Den and Tarun will take questions throughout the event. And with that, I um, hope you guys have a nice cup of coffee. You're settled in for a fun and entertaining and insightful conversation with Den Jones and Tarun Duskan. And with that, I will pass it over to Den. Thanks, Joe. So uh, Tarun, I think you're the man with the slides. So why don't, why don't you kick us off? Awesome. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, thanks, Joe, for the great introduction. So maybe Den and I will start out with a little deeper dive into where we came from, and then we'll jump right into the heart of the content. No, so first of all, um, yes, I joined Banyan in December um, as the Chief Security Officer. I run security, IT, and our customer zero program. And prior to that, I actually led enterprise security at Adobe and Cisco, um, and where we, we implemented a zero trust um, platform and architecture, solution, strategy, uh, covering over 150,000 people and over 200,000 devices. And um, so, yeah, so I've got some scars and some good lessons learned. So, Tarun, over to you. Awesome. Hi, everyone. My name is Tarun Desikin. I'm one of the co-founders of Banyan, and I've been a, in a networking and network engineer for about 20 years. I started my career fairly low down in the stack of Photonics, L1, L2, L3 networking layers, and then I've slowly moved up. Um, and then we've been working on Banyan now close to six years, and we started Banyan, you know, Zero Trust, wasn't really a thing yet. It was just a it was just a thesis and an idea. And it's been amazing to see the market, customers, and the general security industry as a whole evolve to where now we can actually have a conversation on how to roll out zero trust at scale. So for our agenda today, we have a few items we wanted to cover as we think about well, hold, 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 hold. Yeah. And this is this is the same bullshit you'd be done last month, isn't it? So how about how about I've heard that you're into a bit of role playing. So let's let's do a little bit of role playing. I mean, actually, who isn't into a bit of role playing, actually? Um, so um, I'm going to play the role of a new customer. I'm a CSO at uh, some company, and I've heard about some zero trust. And why don't you play the role of the co-founder, COO of a zero trust company trying to sell and educate someone like me on, on, on what Zero Trust is and who Banyan are. So maybe just scrap scrap this kind of deck so we don't kill everyone with slides. Um, I, wanna, I, I wanna just, so first of all, I'm assuming that's okay with you. Yes. Um, yes. Cause I heard you like role playing. So I would love you to play the role and uh, I'm, I'm gonna kick off with, you know, and, and use whatever slides you've got. Um, and I'll, I'll play the role of, of new customer wannabe and the very first thing is I've heard a lot about Zero Trust and I hear everybody is a Zero Trust company these days. So uh, why, why don't you share with me a little bit like what is Zero Trust? Right. Well, uh, if we're gonna do this, then can I suggest the audience also just pepper in questions as they, as they, you know, as they come up? Absolutely, yeah, okay. we'd love, I'd love to see some audience questions. 
Um, and it's especially, you know, if I'm not doing a good job of, of being a customer, then uh, yeah, let's see some audience questions along the okay. way. So, so the, so with, let's just cut through some of the noise, right, in the market. You know, zero trust is probably, actually, before we jump into that, uh, well, zero trust is one of the buzziest terms around. Maybe we'll come back and see what other buzzy terms there are. But why did people even get started with zero trust? How did the concept even come up? What does it even mean? So if you look at it, the fundamentals are actually pretty clear. We built our whole security architecture around a model where an office worker came into the office to do their job. That, that was a fundamental thesis behind how enterprise security was done. So not only did you have to scan a badge to get into the office, or maybe you had someone up front let you in so they know who you were physically, you plugged your laptop in, you got an IP address, and then you were on the network. And that's how you did your job. And that's been that way for like 20 years, right? When you and I started our careers, we had to go to the office to do our job. That, and so security, it made sense that security was based on that model. But if you look today, you know, that's not how, especially after the pandemic, that's just not how the workforce operates anymore. So on this slide, you see on the left-hand side, it's not just about the office worker, the worker who comes to the office. You have a remote workforce. You have developers who are, you know, working from laptops, often from coffee shops, you have third parties. You now have a lot of applications that are you know, in the cloud that need to be part of your corporate uh, enterprise thinking. And then the other, the other concept is that your, your resources don't run in a nicely defined network anymore. You know, Your private applications may run in a data center, but more likely they have moved to the cloud. They're often delivered as SaaS. Your developers are now doing what they call cloud native development. So it, probably changes all the time. So what has essentially happened in our industry is we have basically put band-aid boxes, one on top of the other. The first box was the VPN, then you built a second partner VPN, then you built a web gateway, firewalls, proxies, bastions, just so many boxes. And so what essentially happened is that enterprise security teams do not have control over which device and which user gets access to which application. So the fundamentals of zero trust is just, how do we fix this problem? How do we fix this problem that has happened over the last 10, 15 years of evolution of enterprise and network security? And so the solution, and that's the market term that has evolved, is to create a new layer, which essentially allows access from any user, any device to any resource they need. And doing so provides better security and also a better user experience. So that's my quick summary of what we define zero trust to be. Um, I know you're in the market a lot. You probably see different definitions also, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, it's, it's funny because you get people talking about um, backend workloads. Yes. And you get people talking about things like NAC and network level stuff. And, you know, for, for me, deploying, deploying what I'll think of as a zero trust strategy and architecture and platform was really all about recognizing that user experience is, right. is highly important to an organization. So, so with that in mind, Tarun, why don't, why don't you share a little bit about, so Banyan, what, 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 what do we think we do? Um, I, I, so I get this slide here, like, hey, we're gonna replace a bunch of stuff. From a user experience perspective, though, can you share a little bit about what that user experience is? If you've got 40,000 or 10,000 employees, like what's, what, do they, what do they see? What do they do? Absolutely. But maybe before we jump into that, Joe, do you think you can kick off a quick poll? Um, so one of the concerns you know, I always have is zero trust is a buzzword, right? Like, and, and you I'm have to curious. launch the poll. <laughs> Pardon me? Then has to launch the poll. <laughs> oh yeah, then can launch the poll. Yeah, right. just, I'm just curious, oh. how many of our attendees, okay, what is the number one buzzword in security today? Yeah, is zero trust on par with blockchain or AI? Um, I'm just curious for the audience or shift left even, what do you guys think? Please submit your answers and you know maybe midway through the presentation, we'll, we'll, we'll surface the results, so. Awesome, awesome. So, okay, so user experience. Yeah. I, I, I always think of thousands of people trying right. to access applications and services. So why don't you just share a little bit from that, that angle? So, 
Um, let me just share what a typical zero trust implementation looks like. And then we can go into, hey, what is an example of a user experience for this implementation? And so typically, most users, especially in enterprise environments, are used to some sort of VPN. You know, they, um, and when I go into the demo, I'll show you guys what that means. Uh, the VPN essentially simulates as if you are in the office. That, that's essentially what the VPN was designed to do. It gives you an IP address that belongs in your office IP range, puts you on the network so you can pretend that you're in the office. Uh, a typical zero trust implementation does away with that concept. And instead, it has three core components. It has a, a device user component, it has an access gateway component and a policy engine component. So anytime a user needs to access a resource, they need to be explicitly authenticated. So in, in, in this uh, reference implementation, we go to an identity provider via SAMU to make sure, hey, this is the user. Then we go to an endpoint security tool. Uh, that's via an API to make sure this user is on an approved device. Of course, if the user is in a BYOD or a contractor, you know, you can skip this step. And then you explicitly figure out what user and device it is in the command center. You attest to their posture, and then you give them access into a specific resource. So that's just a high level overview of how a zero trust implementation looks. Now, from a user experience perspective, you know, what, what is the difference? So for that, let me just show you uh, example user experience. So let me start with the VPN first, and then um, you know, we'll jump into a zero trust user experience. So imagine Jens, in my environment, like I'm gonna show you a VPN first. Imagine Den has sent me an email saying, hey, Theron, look, there are some awesome new findings. Hey, click this link to learn more. Okay, so I click the link. So typically in a VPN environment, like the user doesn't always know that this link is behind a VPN. So they click a link, you know, they're like, oh crap, this is behind the VPN. So here they go, they're like, okay, I need to turn on my VPN. Because a VPN by default is seldom on, you need to turn it off. So then you connect, you know, you have to enter some kind of password. Um, most networking guys have caught on to multi-factor authentication. So the next step typically is pull out your mobile app, which I'm going to pull out and enter a passcode. Okay, so now I'm on the VPN and now I can refresh. Okay, at least I have connectivity, but you know, I use, I use a self-signed certificate. So then I get in. So this is- uh, this is. Can, the, I, can I pause for a second? So public service announcement for the audience, don't click random links from strange Scottish guys, right? But keep going. Yes, with it. And even Chrome warns you, not secure a strange Scottish guy, right? Mm -hmm. Like it warns you. Yeah. So this is the user experience many traditional VPN customers are accustomed to. And then, they, you know, you can train your workforce, they get used to it, you know, they just, they suck it up. But if you saw me there, I lost like two, three minutes of my day just connecting to an application, right? And, and the more and more workforce will not tolerate that. Um, so that's from the user experience side, like, let me just show you one thing before I jump into zero trust user experience. So this was a crap user experience, but probably what's even worse is it's a fairly insecure system. So let me just do one thing here and show you how insecure it is. So I dropped you onto the network just so you could access one website. So let me just, I'm on the network so I can ping the website. Ping works just fine because I'm on the network. I can take that. IP address there, I can, and I can start poking around a different port. Oh, look, port 22 is open. Not only is port 22 open, it's running a vulnerable version of OpenSSH, great. Now I can start entering that server if I was a hacker. And so I can, then I can start moving laterally in the network. So the VPN is just a fundamentally broken security model. It's yeah. also a fundamentally bad user experience. And th th there was a couple of things, yeah, because I want to I want to hover on this this thing just before you go to the what the good experience is. But I, I, you know, I was always saying to people, well, two things. One is when you build a VPN out, your full time employees generally get wide open access to that network. You you don't have from a cost perspective the desire to get to fine grain. So when people talk about least privilege. Right. I think the industry is a little bit flawed or it's maybe our dirty little secret that we're not really doing least privilege because 
all employees get access to all the stuff. The other thing is, is most VPN systems still rely on really old fashioned tables in order to give access to IP addresses. And then those IP addresses resolve back to an application, but generally it might be even a load balancer. Um, whereas what we're doing in the future is, is we're using our existing directory identity based access and not giving you full access to, to the, the network. The other thing is from a user experience, users shouldn't need to know if the application is hosted internally right. or cloud, they just want to get to their app. So can you show us what, what does a good experience look like where I can just get to the app? Right. So let me just turn off my VPN to, sh to answer the question you posed like five minutes ago on what a good experience looks like. So let me just disconnect. So I'm, I'm no longer on the VPN. You can see I no longer can access this. Um, a good experience would be, hey, I get this email. I click on the link. And it's just like clicking on a, on a bookmark. Okay, and I'm, let, let me just show you all the steps one by one before I, uh, let me just open an in private window so you can see the actual steps and then I'll show you the actual seamless experience. So good experience would be, you click on a link, behind the scenes, the system checks your device and that was a certificate prompt. It sends you into your identity provider. In a that was you there, so that certificate to run that's what we're doing to replace the username and password. Is that what we're doing there? It's doing a couple of things. The first thing the certificate does, actually, let me just even show you the certificate again. So, you know, our, our participants can see it in gory detail. So if I click on the certificate information, it does two things, right? The certificate, the first thing it does is it tells me what my device serial number is. So I can attest to the device strongly. I can authenticate the device. The second thing it does is the certificate also contains my username. In this case, my persona is Daisy at Midsoft. So it also attests to my user. So the certificate essentially authenticates my device and the user. Yeah. And so some people call this passwordless. You don't need to enter a password anymore. You just and if you've got system. five devices, you've got five unique certificates. And then what that means, if I'm a bad actor trying to log into your device with another username or password, that's not going to be, be possible to access our applications and services because our, our platform expects that certificate. It yes. does expect another device. Yes. So Which from an IT support perspective, I'll tell you, sometimes, no, I love that because I'm like, the IT support team can't have their accounts hijacked to then go and, and re rampaging through the environment. It, it really helps us lock it down. Right, so I think one of the most common threat vectors, you know, phishing attacks is I think what you're, you're referring to is a user's username and password gets compromised. But, but, you know, and it's not that hard, it's just a password and most likely it's like your daughter's name dash birth date or something like that, right? It's not that sophisticated <laughs> or it's solar winds one, two, three, you know, it, it gets pretty bad. So it's pretty easy to compromise a credential. And this really secures you against credential compromise, which is one of the most common attacks you see today. Yep. Yep. Awesome. So but, the good experience. So you've clicked the link, you went so to the, the app. Yeah. So let me just, let me just come back and, and, you know, so I'm in this browser, so that's a good experience, right? So let me just do that again. So the good experience is transparently, I click a link, it opens up. If, I've, if I have an act, active session, it won't even ask me for this, but, but I keep opening in an incognito browser. You know, it just asks me for my MFA to activate a session and I'm in. Like in. I'm not talking about turning on a VPN, tunneling my traffic. And then that, that certificate pop-up is purely for the purpose of demo. Normally, yes. the user yeah. experience, you don't see yeah. that. Yeah, we suppress that cert under most situations. And, you know, things like a ping don't work. Like you're not put on the network. You're just given access to that specific application. You know, you can't really poke around and see what other ports are available. You can't move laterally. So not only did we significantly improve the user experience, you just click a link, it just works. A, a modern VPN alternative will also prevent you from moving laterally in the network. So it also improves your overall security posture. So that's just a, a quick, and just to extend this further, you know, think about a mobile device. This flow works seamlessly on a mobile device. And nobody wants to install a VPN on their personal phone. Right? Like I just, 
It's just yeah. constant. It drains the battery. It sends all my network packets all over the place. It's just the worst thing ever. Awesome. So couple of couple of things. So so that's one. That's like the users and the users are going out there. They're they're doing their business. So yeah, let's talk a little bit about the benefits here. One one of the things that that I I, I used to always share with executives. Um, either as part of the deployments I've been involved in or just in general, when I meet people out at conferences and elsewhere, I almost say it's like, you're, you're going to improve the user experience because I'm not doing passwords during authentication. I'm not VPNing in. I'm just going directly to the applications and services. And then even from a privileged perspective, if I'm talking about DevOps or privileged management and things of that nature, um, you know, we we could we we would sit maybe cyber arc behind this, or if you're you're not doing like um, I'll call that like full on privileged identity management. Let's say you just want to actually get access to to infrastructure in AWS, you can go via our platform, do a posture check of a device, um, and and then you can get in, and, and we can do short lived sessions, tie that into like um, you know something like service now. Um, so use cases, I, I, I start to rack up a couple of things here, right? I've got improving the user experience and for thousands of users, I've got DevOps type people that are running platforms and services. Uh, we got a thing called service tunnel. And then ultimately I've, I've got this new way of working where I'm not getting access to the full network. And then I can turn my network into a guest type network like a Starbucks. And, and that would mean that any time someone is on the network in the office, I, I can't just suddenly, even while I'm on that network, just run rampage through the network. So any any other use cases that you think that you tell people about when you share what Banyan does? Well, I think, um, especially as it pertains to a traditional VPN, and I used to be a network engineer, uh, I spent a lot of time maintaining IP whitelists. It, it was it was just a thing, and it was so easy when we got started. You, you know, uh, at my first company, I remember we had our headquarters were in in Sunnyvale, and then we had a couple of remote offices: one in the East Coast in Maryland, um, one in Pennsylvania. And so, essentially, we just IP whitelisted those two offices, connected them to our our network, and it was great. It was fine. So that's where everything starts. Right? But today, if you look at someone's IP whitelist, there are like thousands of lines. Something as simple as I need Slack webhook to you know, trigger an internal application workflow. Something as simple as that. Someone says on Slack, hey, Den, kick off this approval workflow. Okay, they set up an API integration. You have to IP whitelist, not just Slack. Slack is now owned by Salesforce. You have to IP whitelist every single Salesforce data center around the globe. And it keeps changing. And the only time you as a network admin know is when something breaks and the guy emails you saying, oh, my Slack webhook is not working. The, my CFO did not know about this deal I was going to sign. So now everybody is really pissed off with the network engineer because the IP whitelist didn't work. So uh, one of the key things you want to kind of move away from or you can move away from is this idea of maintaining these long access control lists based on IP addresses. And, as someone who did this for a long time, that really excites me. Just moving away from IP whitelisting is, is just a, a big win. And I was, I was, a, I mean, I was, a, I've been a directory guy since the mid nineties, right? So for me, I always think of it like, all I want to do is say, hey, that's the group of people can access the app. And if I've added you to the group, then you can get access to the app and it should all just flow. And then you're suddenly like, oh, wait a minute, the network level, I need to go do some extra widgets and da, da, da. So moving away from that was a bit of a joy. I, I, right, I got a question. So, so Banyan integrates with many things as part of a zero trust architecture or solution. There's this notion of trust score. Now, can you show me, so what, what is a trust score and, and what, what affects or changes a trust score? Yeah, um, so one of the key principles of zero trust is to get user and device context in to make a decision. And, and what we saw historically was that people relied a lot on roles, uh, role-based access control, RBAC, 
They might use ABAC, uh, attributes-based access control, which is all fine. They're all good techniques, but they just became very, very, very complicated. Like, yeah. You know, the thousands of roles in an organization, the hundreds of attributes, then you acquire a company, you suddenly get 200 attributes. So those techniques just became so complicated and, and it didn't help with the fundamental problem statement, which is, is this user and device trusted? That's all you're trying to figure out. And so in Banyan, we came up with this idea of a trust code. I um, guess I don't have a ready-made slide for it, but maybe I'll just show you the Banyan app. So we came up with a simple concept of a trust score, which we show in the Banyan app. We can visually see it in the Banyan app that looks like this. And to us, a trust score is pretty simple. It's what are the factors that your enterprise security team, your organization thinks is important that makes you trusted. So in my demo organization, it's pretty simple. I've just used my device's basic posture. As long as you come from a device that's registered, maintains good hygiene in terms of the firewall and the operating system and the disk encryption, I will trust you. I will trust the device. Now, uh, in some of our larger organizations, this is just a small demo organization. In some of our larger customers, you know, they extend what trust means. If you're on a managed device, it must be running CrowdStrike and CrowdStrike must say it is not compromised. Um, as a user, you must be running an entity behavioral analytics tool and that behavioral analytics tool must say you have not performed any risky behavior in the last 24 hours. So we quantify the trust. And then this trust is what gives you access to the application I showed you. It allows you to kind of move around and access this application. <clears throat> so you compute the trust and you make it very simple to understand. Green is good, red is bad. And if you're green, you get access. Now let's just make my trust score low. Let's see what happens. So there are a few different ways. I can launch some malware, but since I have a demo account, I can just click that button. And when I click that button, it drops my trust score to zero. So just for demo purposes, it overrides my trust score. So me now as a user, I know something is not right. Why is my trust score zero? And from an access perspective, if I refresh this page, I, all my access also gets blocked. I no longer can access the resources. Previously, I could just click a button and get to it. And so the trust score on one hand is user facing and tells the user what their level of trust is. And on the other hand, it is in real time enforced from a policy perspective. If your trust falls, you lose access. And so it's just a way to simplify how to implement zero trust in an organization. And and you could you could start off <clears throat> having this be passive so that you know you're you're not going to block their access to begin with. You can configure this so that over time you might decide, hey, I want to I want to now enforce a level of posture. But but maybe before as you ramp up in your project, you know, you don't have to begin like that. Um I I, I certainly know. Uh, from experience of, of doing this before that, you know, when you enable something like this with self remediation, right, the people instantly that like we saw a huge improvement just on the posture of our endpoints, just by enabling this. I mean, it, it was it was great just to kind of see people self remediate and improve the posture. And then the other thing is, if I've got contractors, where I'm not in charge of their configuration, I can use this as a method to say, hey, I can still let contractors work with us because the only other method that I know of where people say, I need to have these vendors and contracts use, contractors use my apps and services is you deploy a very expensive VDI platform and then they connect to a managed device. So rather than spending all that money, a, a great way to leverage something like this, because again, you're just trying to ensure a minimum a minimum set of security requirements to access the app. You, you don't want to deploy a very expensive VDI platform. Historically, for contractors, third parties, they've either set up a completely separate VPN. You know, sometimes they do that. They call it a vendor VPN. They'll set up a completely separate yep. VPN stack, gives them completely different network rights, or they'll set up a VDI platform, both of which, if you think about it, is a, is a huge amount of perimeter security infrastructure. And uh, which is actually what, and we've learned this the hard way, it's actually really easy to bypass. It's really easy to get past those. So it's not only is it expensive, it's actually pretty easy to bypass as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and yeah, definitely in most cases they do both. 
because <laughs> yeah. they're doing they're doing the VPN partner networks or um, things of that nature just to give access to apps. But but in order to trust the device or think about a better security posture on the device, then they'll also do the VDI thing too. Yes, yes, and, and that's a very expensive proposition. And it's a really clunky user experience. You know, vendors are forced to do business with you, especially if you're a large company, so you can put them through that. But I think the world is changing. You know, there are much easier, simpler, more effective ways to pull off. Yeah. Uh, all of these and things. then, well, you end up in large organizations, vendors that work on site still quite often turn up with their own devices and they're accessing your apps and services while they're on site from a device that you have no idea what the posture is. Yeah, and, and they figure apps. out that if you're on site, you can just plug into the ethernet connection and yep. suddenly, you know, you have full access. I mean, we see this over and over again where inconsistent security posture, you know, depending on how you connect to a resource, we will enforce different policies. Yeah. And I think that is the antithesis of zero trust. It's just, I, I understand why administrators have to do it sometimes, but, but if you were designing a system from scratch, I think you would say, it doesn't matter how you connect, you get the same policy enforcement. And I think that's another tenet of zero trust. Yeah, and we, we previous companies, we used this mechanism so that we had one enforcement and it was during the auth to the app. Right. And, and that means that you don't need to then go go over complex on your NAC stuff right. or your VPN stuff or these other things. You just need it while you're logging in. And it's a very easy way to interject this into the, the authentication workflow. Um, that, oh, oh, so on, on this is, so this is the admin console, right? So this is where you set up the policies and stuff. So is there, there, you know, I, I think it's a very easy way to say, hey, I want to associate this app with this policy and, and, and require certain things. So do you want to just give a couple of seconds on, on these policies in the app? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I just wanted to highlight a couple of things in, in the Banyan product. You know, we spoke a lot about the end user experience, how it's so easy from the end user perspective. And, and while that is true, one of the things that we also really wanted to do was make it easy for an administrator to kind of move to a modern, like a VPN replacement solution. And so part of that means so what does it mean to move to a modern VPN? The, the first thing for us, at least it meant is that you need to insert yourself seamlessly. And so we have a capability called service tunnels, which is under the hood, a WireGuard VPN. So we do give you a VPN. So on day one, you just turn on the service tunnel and your users just don't even know anything has changed. They can still have the same VPN experience. And then from an administrative perspective, you know, they don't have to worry about change management or any of those concepts. They just turn one thing off, turn the other thing on, turn Banyan on and you're done, you're in. And then gradually you can start publishing more granular policies and more granular services. And what that essentially means is once you publish a service, the user no longer needs to be on a network to access that application. They will be able to access the application by asserting user and device trust. That's what publishing a service in Banyan means. And once you do that, you can also write more sophisticated policies. So for example, this is a, this is a maybe I'll start with a simple policy and then talk about a more sophisticated policy. Uh, a simple policy would be, hey, these users, users on a registered device or administrators, you know, can access this resource. So there's no IP address, complicated language here. So you can start with some very simple policies just based on the user groups, which, which is what these essentially are. And then as you get more sophisticated, you can start uh, getting more complicated policies, you know, that go into what type of URLs they can access, um, you know, what different complex trust scoring algorithms and so forth. But the idea is once you start on this journey, you start with the very basics and then you can progress and improve over time. I always, I always think of simple, stupid is best um, because the more complex then, then, then A, the more expensive, but, but B, it, it can become quite confusing after a while. So I think, I think you have the ability to say, look, I wanna publish all my applications, say they're Okta or paying enabled applications i want to publish the apps and i'll have one policy that governs access to all the apps um then i'll maybe use my directories group membership to say if you're allowed to access specific applications 
And then as you go through this environment, the access gateway pieces, if the applications are inside your network, then that's really the reverse proxy that enables that internal access. Um, one, one thing, do you need an army to build all this stuff out, Tarina? I'm getting really nervous. I'm going to need an army of, of people. So yeah. Um, do, 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 how, how expensive does this become to operate? Yeah, I mean, one of the things we're really proud of is this kind of the self-serve model that we have created. Um, I, I, you know, as I mentioned, I come from a network networking background and we used to build God boxes where forget about an army on your side. We used to send you our wizards as well to set it up. Right? That's how for the longest time networking was sold is, you know, we would send you our wizards. You would have a bunch of guys on your side. They'd spend a month together, cobbling together all the cables and writing the policies. And um, it's, it's just not how things work anymore. So the Banyan product at least is available for free on the internet. You can download it. You can get started in less than 15 minutes. That's our promise. And uh, we have several videos of people doing it as well as videos and tutorials for you to get started. So one of the cool things about a good zero trust solution like such as ourselves is that not only is it secure and designed for scale, you can also self-serve and get started immediately. So oh, yeah, uh, so I don't need to, so hold on. So the pesky salespeople, I mean, I, I, I do like salespeople and I always joke about it, but after 25 years of, of being a customer, I was always getting hounded by salespeople and, and, you know, sometimes you, you try and dodge them. So there's nothing better for me than to see a product that I can actually go online, get signed up, set the thing up or, or have my team set the thing up um and, and actually start getting some value pretty quick so i i want to go back to the the so the self-service but the, the notion for me um having been a banning customer long ago so i'll change my hats right now because i'm role playing right so as a previous banning customer um i i didn't i didn't have to increase my staff i mean i increased the the, the team by one because the existing directory team the existing octa team the existing endpoint team they were the people that really just tweaked slightly what we were doing in order to make this real. So I, I think that that for me was pretty, pretty impressive. Now, just to remind the audience, we do have a, a buzzword poll. So, hey, we'd love you to click that poll button. And, and really all we're asking for is, hey, what's the, what's the biggest buzzword? And I, I think so far, Zero Trust is, is the winner. Um, <laughs> I, I, I really think that, you know, blockchain security and XDR, these things are, these things are hot in the heels though. Um, and, and everything is digital transformation and it always has been, so. <laughs> just, to, just to take that discussion a little further then. So this is a reference implementation. And the good thing is, uh, well, when we first got started, this was still kind of new. People were like, what are you building? Why is this important? But in the last couple of years, uh, kind of what has happened is we've had some really successful rollouts. And so I just want to cover a couple of those and not just some of them have been small, you know, five, less than 500 users, but some of them have been really large scale and it's been really awesome to see. So uh, one example is a global technology company that we've mentioned several times in this webinar already. Um, today, if you, if you talk to them, pretty much every employee is using Banyan to access their internal resources. And probably the best part is not a single employee knows Banyan even exists because it's so transparent and just behind the scenes. And uh, the way we were able to accomplish that, uh, the way we were able to both impact user experience and security is by integrating with those existing tools. You yep. know, you, if, once, if you build a platform that just leverages your existing investment in identity and device and even networking, you can roll out zero trust with a relatively small uh, workforce, a uh, relatively small team, and have a big impact. Yeah, and no, so th this was one of those examples that you mentioned. I'm familiar. Yeah. yeah. I'm familiar. yeah. Now, the, 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 yeah, one of the things for me, and I'll, I'll share something was, we, we had someone contact our security team and they, they thought they were the genius that had discovered some big security vulnerability within the company. And they're like, I can get all these internal apps and services without needing to VPN in. And they opened up a security incident. The security team started to investigate because they didn't connect the dots. And then they reached out to our team. And we were like, well, wait a minute. 
Is the device got our certificate? Is the device meeting the posture check? Was the IT managed? Was it talking about connecting to apps that were already published via our Zero Trust platform? And we're like, there's no magic here. <laughs> they are, they are a, a user benefiting from our Zero Trust platform. And they were just like, holy shit. And I think the, the cool thing was, is we didn't contact a lot of users. Like we done a, a, an article on our intranet to say what we were doing, but, but I've never had to contact someone and say, would you like to log in less? Right. Would you like to access stuff without having to VPN in? Like you don't ask your users that kind of question. So it was really, it was really cool because not only did this person think they were the genius that found the, 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 the security flaw, but, but then the security team, the, the incident team, um, they hadn't connected the dots and they're like, oh crap, is there something going on here? And then it was when it, they got to our team and we were part of the same security organization. So it's like, you're kind of laughing about like, oh my God, this, this is how transparent this thing is and how well it works. And you know, for, for a company that's got 30,000, 40,000 people, it's a big, it's a big change. Um, so yeah. Now, I know we're, we're going through time here, so let's see how that poll's looking. And then are there any questions from our audience? I'm not seeing any. Um, I could invent some. Um, if we're none, I, I've got another one for you. So integrations with existing technology. So one of the things that I thought was really cool was the CrowdStrike um, piece where you show there's some malware in the device and it instantly cuts the sessions. So I think that's a cool thing. And then the other thing is um, service tunnel. So we've got this kind of DevOps scenario. So either, either of those two things, I'd love you to share just a little bit about both of those. Yeah, and then I'm going to have a question for you, Dan, after this on how does someone get started? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah I've got podcasts. So, like yeah, so I, I'm going to answer your question on, on service tunnel DevOps integrations, which is another case study. So... I'm guessing most of our audience has eaten at this restaurant chain. It's a nationwide restaurant chain. And uh, when you have an organization like this, what you're talking about is many of these restaurant chains are actually software companies because they are uh, franchise models running you know, multiple, multiple thousands of different types of software, depending on the type of restaurant location and so forth. And um, this is one place where they had they were in a traditional Fortinet shop, traditional VPN, had been using it for 20 or 30 years. They, they worked. And what Banyan was able to do was essentially move them to a model where the developers were able to run faster. So that was using some concepts that, that we had previously discussed, like a service tunnel and a catalog of services. They were able to connect to their resources faster. And from the operations perspective, using Banyan's techniques, you know, we really were able to simplify the networking. When you were in a restaurant previously, in order to access your application, all traffic was being backhauled to headquarters, which back in the day wasn't a big deal. But come COVID, uh, the restaurants to go orders had just basically, you know, they basically converted every restaurant from a sit down restaurant to a to go restaurant. So every single transaction was happening over the network. It had become insanely slow. So moving to a zero trust model actually significantly simplified operations as well, simplified the networking setup. So connectivity could go straight to where the applications were instead of backhauling it through some network choke points. So those two techniques allow, allowed this particular restaurant chain to both you know, scale how quickly they could deliver their software, but also deliver their sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> and it is almost lunchtime. Um, now I feel like I want to be like Robin from Howard Stern, where I just laugh in the background. Is that you just hear uh, her laughing? <laughs> you can laugh if you, if you start making lunch for us, you know. I mean, I don't know. Order some DoorDash. So I, I wanted to have a, I had a question for you. So in your career, when you were rolling out Zero Trust, how did you say you decided? Because first of all, how did you decide you wanted to do a Zero Trust project at these organizations? Like, how did it happen? Um, was it a board mandate? Was it just an innovative engineer saying, I want to try this then? And then once yeah. you decided you want to do it, how do you get started? So it's funny, 2017, I, I was fortunate to be working with an architect in the organization. Uh, so 
I hired this really creative and fun guy to work with. We're, we're still friends and hang out today. And he kept going on and on and on and on and on about this thing called Beyond Corp and Zero Trust. And I'm like, I'm like, but but we've got a really good opt implementation. It was really solid. I'm like, why do I want to make it more fragile and add another cog in the thing? And he kept going on and on about it. And then he started talking about, well, could you imagine doing a password list? Can you imagine? And, and he was starting to tell me, and I'm like, all of a sudden, I'm like, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm now curious. So go ahead and throw a pilot together. So a couple of weeks later, he comes back and he's like, okay, I've got this kind of rough pilot here. And he shows me logging into an application without a password. And I'm like, holy shit, you got me there, right? And then the second thing was, oh, and the application was on our internal network and, and I'm going via the guest guest network. So I'm basically coming in and there was no fee, no VPN. And, and, and that was before we met Banyan, right? So our initial deployment was, was really an in, injected into the authentication workflow, a really basic posture check because the technology partners we had, it, it wasn't, it was really, really basic. Um, and and then, then if it was an internal app, then it would route through. What, what we recognized was if I ran the identity and access platforms and I, the, I, I'm the, the off king of, of the company, then I don't need to ask permission. So we started with authentication, leveraging the existing investment and the existing team. And, and then we, we got better um, as, as part of that piece. And when we met Banyan, it was a case of, I wanted to find a company that could consolidate three of the vendors that were part of the existing architecture and have one vendor. So, and and actually, I wanted better posture check. I wanted I wanted a bit better control over the policies and stuff of that nature. So, so we started there. We leveraged the, the same team that was doing all the the NAC stuff and the logging and the endpoint team, the device management team. So, existing talent was huge. What we did do is we brought in one person who would really focus on this being their day job. Um, so that that was really, really important for us. And what was ironic, when I got to when I got to Cisco, Cisco were investing heavily on this. In fact, they were investing so heavily, they had so many people. What, what I had to do is grab one of the leaders and say, okay, you're going to be the one leading this forward. Let's let's excuse everybody else. We almost excused 70 people from being involved. And, and we'd pull people in as when we needed, but ultimately having an army isn't necessarily the best thing because it slows you down. You've got too many opinions, too many people. And then the other thing is from an executive sponsor perspective, you need those execs to be totally on board. And, and the way I done that, I didn't really tell them about zero trust. I wasn't using the buzzword. I was just talking about outcomes. Would you like 40,000 people to not enter username and password? Would you like 40,000 people to not have to use VPN? If your answer is yes, let me go deliver this. And I didn't spend much money. I mean, it wasn't multi-million dollars per year. It wasn't a huge operational cost. Um, so the thing for us was getting out the gate was pretty quick and we deployed in seven months from, from that silly POC to 40,000 people, 2,000 apps. Um, I can't remember the number of devices, but probably about 50 to 60,000 devices. It was pretty quick. But, but that's a huge scale then. You're talking tens of thousands of users and devices. What, what, what advice would you give for someone with a much smaller organization, 200, 500, 1,000 employees? Well, you can go in 15 minutes or less, I guess. Yeah, um, I think so. I, I, you know, I would, I would love to say, yeah, you start, you start with what the vision is and the vision's not the marketing hype. Going back to our polls, and this is why we've done the buzzword poll, right? It's not about the buzzwords. It's about let's start with a little set of outcomes. So when you're selling the vision, you're talking about outcomes. You're talking about results that the business will benefit from, Right. You get a small core team, you get a really small use case. Maybe all I want to do is have one engineering team that, that access lab stuff within AWS or lab stuff on-prem or, or maybe both. 
I want to start there. Or maybe I just want to start with dealing with one application that is used by HR. And we're like, hey, we want the HR people when they log into that one app to ensure the posture check on the device is good. That's it. Start there. Get, get it out there. Um, the, the, the focus communication is funny because some of it was it was really all internal and and i i became a big fan of doing you know here's my weekly here's the weekly status update and in the top right dropping in a number number of business days to done i wanted to create a sense of urgency at cisco it was about rsa we wanted to be on stage talking about it at adobe it was a case of we had m a's around the corner so we're like well in order to be ready, we might need to have that communication. You remove the holidays, the weekends, so that that number is as small as it can be. And then when you meet people, you're like, you know, we've only got 47 days left. We can keep talking about this and procrastinate all you want, but but we've got we've got a deadline. Yeah, you know. And that, that was all that for me was brilliant. I was never a good fan of PMs that continually said their project's green because they moved the date. That just doesn't work, you know. I got a I got a couple of questions coming through, um, and so guys, you can send them directly to me or to put them in the Q and A. It doesn't matter. Um, so you've said that you mentioned passwordless, and but how do you, how do, how does that work if we're moving to passwordless when there are regulators that have requirements about um, passwordless or you know resetting passwords every ninety days? Like oh yeah, let me so. I'm going to put my Banyan CSO hat on for a minute, right? Because I'm playing these different roles, right? So as the Banyan CSO, we've got our SOC 2. We're about to go through our second, uh, our annual audit, right? So we do an internal audit. And as part of that, they have this thing that says passwords every 90 days, blah, blah, blah. In both Adobe and Cisco, we, we nix that. We say we're going to follow NIST guidelines. But the control about changing your passwords every 90 days was born in the, the late 90s because that's, that's when they th said, we don't know if someone's compromised your account. So the first thing they're going to do is say, well, let's change it every so often so that if it is compromised, that's the longest a bad person will have it. But we're being attacked differently now. You can change your password every four seconds for all I care. If your device is compromised, they got it every four seconds, right? So the reality is, is, Move into certificate based where you store that certificate, you know, in the TPM or secure enclave that 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 enabled us to move away from saying to auditors, passwords are as important. They're not as important. And we've got MFA. And then maybe we've got some security intelligence where we're working out if it's possibly compromised. So the, the cool thing is, is then you go to auditors and say, we're not doing this, but we are doing these things here. So as we go through our SOC to, we can demonstrate why passwords are not a good method, why changing your password, because all you're ever going to do is add another one at the end or some bullshit. The reality is, is people skirt around that crap pretty easy. So yeah, easy answer. Uh, ha ha having said that, you know, Joe, we do support passwords. If you really want to put your users through a lot of pain, if you really want to, I mean... <laughs> you can't turn on passwordless and, and make them rotate their passwords every four seconds. Yeah. One of the other things that you guys mentioned, um, and thanks for the questions, um, that uh, has resulted in fewer support tickets. Um, yeah. Um, and how does that work if you're, if you're, how do you? Right. So if, if you no longer have forced your users to change passwords every 90 days, you no longer have confused users contacting the service desk when they lock themselves out because they forgot their new password. So in a service desk and large organizations, password related tickets are usually always in the top 10. Um, and what we found when we implemented this uh, during my time at Adobe was the service desk ticket reduction was about 60 to 80%. So just from a cost perspective, that's huge. Not to mention everyone being pissed off because every 90 days you have to change your password and then you go and update five devices and blah, blah, blah. Well, well I feel like the, there are tick, there's also ticket reduction unrelated to the password. So a common, uh, a common issue is, is actually network performance. 
you know, when you use a VPN and you're backhauling a lot of traffic, and maybe if you haven't set up the split tunneling properly, and there's so many misconfigurations that can happen. So I remember I, I one of my favorite tickets was was titled, Why Do You Care What Netflix Movie I Am Watching? So we had a customer that had for whatever reason, they'd set up their Pry Tunnel servers in, in AWS, I guess. And But when you turned on the VPN, all your Netflix traffic was going through it. And they had an employee who had uh, traveled abroad and really wanted to watch Netflix because he was traveling for work, he was abroad. And he figured out that if he turned his VPN on, he could watch his Netflix shows. And it's also good for the BBC iPlayer. Yeah, entirely. But, but essentially, they, by backhauling the traffic through through the data center, he was able to watch VPN while abroad, while Netflix was sorry. Watch no, Netflix. No, while we are, we are, we are. I'm going to say we're co-writing, but I guess you need to pull your finger out and get involved in the co-writing piece of this. But we are going to have a VPN, a, a blog or something that is talking about. Hey, I'm just a twisted VPN vendor. I'm a big box maker and I'm now a zero trust person, but everything needs to come via me because I want to look at your packets. But now, in, in this case, online on, that's a bad thing, isn't it? In, in this case, forget about looking at his packets. He was bringing the entire VPN infrastructure down. Right? The amount of traffic, <laughs> I mean, the amount of traffic these Netflix shows take is not trivial. And, you know, if you, yeah. if you run, run it long enough or you run it at the right time, you know, you're going to yeah. break people's networks. So, yeah. so another reason you actually cut down on support tickets is just by simplifying networking. You just simplify yeah. networking, give point-to-point -point access, make it performant, and people will stop filing tickets. I mean, if I'm going from a workstation in Starbucks to my cloud app like Salesforce, isn't it a good thing for me to come into the corporate network to then go back out? Or there might be situations, direct, you know, there, there might be situations where you do want the traffic to come to you. Um, and we should, you should accommodate that. It's just that most VPNs were built assuming all traffic should come to yeah, you. And yeah. I think we're well past that. And, and then that came up with a really good term. So what I'm, this is the only reason I want this blog post to be finished, guys, is because, look, I think that, you know, um, video killed the radio star, but I think VPNs kill the Zoom video star. Yes. I just want, you know, I, I don't care about the rest of the blog. I just want that line to be out there and go viral. So yeah. everybody, I know we're, we're at time. So we really appreciate everyone's participation. We concluded the poll realizing that, yep, zero trust is, is mm -hmm. the most overused buzzword and marketing term. And we apologize because we participate in that as, as another vendor that claims to be zero trust. Joe even has that in the background. So everybody, thank you very much. Uh, we'd love your feedback. So please, uh, share any feedback with us and um, anything before we wrap to ruin or Joe. Yeah. So we'll be recording this session and we'll send out the recording to you and all the other registrants and uh, you can go ahead and share it. We'll also be sharing it again on social media. We saw some of you came in from uh, our Twitter feed. So nice to see you. Welcome to the party. Um, and we'll be hosting yet another webinar. Um, I think it's the 22nd of May. And I think that's going to be a deep dive into uh, uh, DevOps and how uh, Banyan can help secure DevOps infrastructure is kind of a groovy thing. Um, so thanks so much. We'll talk to you guys soon. Yeah, Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye, everybody.